Hey, what's up everybody? Today I wanted to install Fedora Linux on the Dell XPS 13. I made a different video called Installing Arch Linux in 15 Minutes, which has been really well received, but it's only for advanced users. I wanted to show you if you're a beginner and just want to get started with Linux, but don't want to type a bunch of things in the command line, is there a better Linux for you? And so I've got Fedora Linux, which has a fully graphical installer. I'm gonna walk through that install on this laptop, and then we're gonna go ahead and install Steam on it to show you how you can do games on Linux. Let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing we're gonna do with Linux is make a USB installation key. Linux needs some way to get the data from it onto your laptop, and a USB key is the way we do that. Now you can Google for Fedora 24 workstation, and you can get to the Fedora website and download an image. The instructions on how to make a USB key vary by which system you're using. So if you're using Windows, we're gonna use a tool called Image USB. If you're using Mac, we can just use DD, or there's some other software you can install that has a graphical side to it. And if you're doing using Linux, you probably already know how to do this, but there's a couple tools for that too. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to link to them in the show notes since they're very different processes for Windows, uh, Mac, and Linux. Uh, but I'm gonna assume that you have a USB key with the image on it. I do wanna make a clarification that if you just download the image and drag it to the USB key, that won't work. Uh, the reason is, is because the USB key will still have like a Windows file system on it. Uh, we wanna use the Linux file system to install Linux. And so using the image tools allow us to actually put the Linux installer on there rather than just copying the file, which is a small but meaningful distinction because if you just copy the file, your computer can't boot off of it. You actually have to write the entire file system, write the bootloader, and then that way the BIOS knows that there's an operating system on there, not just regular old files. So in order to actually boot from a USB key, your laptop is gonna to need to be able to pick the USB key as a boot option. There's lots of different laptops out there in lots of different ways. Uh, in general, most laptops can select a boot device using either the F1 key, the F2 key, the delete key, or the F12 key. Now that varies per laptop, so you may have to hit a couple different keys to see what your laptop responds to at boot. Uh, you could also just Google your laptop model and probably find it that way. In this case, I have the Dell XPS 13, which means I can just hit F12 and that will go ahead and allow me to select the USB key for the booting. So I'm gonna go ahead and power up the laptop and hit F12 and we're gonna select the USB key. So the laptop's booting up, I got the black BIOS screen here and I'm just gonna pretty much hit F12 over and over again. That's gonna allow me to boot up uh, and select it. And so it went ahead and it did that and now I'm gonna select Start Fedora Live Click that, and so as you can see, it's already booting up. Uh, it's gonna take a couple minutes. It depends completely on the speed of your USB key. So Linux itself is not slow. Linux isn't capable of being slow. Uh, it's, it's all C, it's super fast. Uh, what is slow is your storage devices. So uh, if you get a really slow old USB key, a USB one key or something like that, uh, there's so many cheap slow ones out there that some of those can take a really long time to boot. In this case, I'm using a USB 3.0 SanDisk key. Uh, I paid a little bit more money, you know, 15 bucks instead of 10 bucks. So it boots faster. And even while I was telling you about that, it's already booted to the graphical screen. So if you're at home and this is taking a long time, it's probably your USB key and it's probably just a cheapo one. You can either buy a better one or just deal with that slowness, but it's not Linux, it's the USB key. So we're gonna go ahead and click Try Fedora. There's two options here, Install and Try. Uh, try also lets you install, so just click Try because what we're gonna do with Try is, is we're gonna see, is our hardware compatible right out of the box? Uh, so when you boot into Try, you can go ahead and check the Wi-Fi, you can check your brightness keys, you can check your audio keys, and you can check and just make sure that things work like your mouse and uh, that everything looks right to you. And so that's what the Try mode is great for, is you can just stick a live USB key in basically any computer and see, does this work out of the box with Linux? And with Fedora 24, we're getting really new drivers uh, which is a lot different, for instance, than Windows. With Windows, you typically install Windows and then download a bunch of drivers. And that downloading it, it entails things like going on Google and searching for drivers off random manufacturers' websites, and it's a big pain. Linux basically comes with all the drivers in it. There's a few exceptions there, like people like NVIDIA don't play nice like all the rest of the manufacturers do. Uh, but in general, most of the drivers come with it. And in this case, we're running an Intel laptop. Intel laptops... Uh, with Intel graphics have great open source driver support, so they almost always work out of the box. AMD has made huge strides here too. They recently just got an open source driver out that performs really well, uh, but Intel has a longer track record of doing it the right way. 
So what we're doing now is we've tested out, made sure that we have Wi-Fi, made sure that our brightness keys work, made sure that in general everything looks good, and we're going to go ahead and click the install button. The install process is going to go ahead and overwrite our data on our hard drive and put Linux on instead. So on this next screen here, we're going to see that we're going to pick our disk. Uh, we're going to tell it whether or not we want it encrypted. I would recommend you encrypt your hard drives. The cool thing about that is, is although you have to enter a passphrase every time you boot, if somebody else gets your laptop, they won't just get your files and your other passwords and stuff. So if you're using like a password manager or if you keep your any sensitive files, etc., if somebody got your laptop, whether it's an Apple, a Windows laptop, or a Linux laptop, if it's not encrypted, they can get all your personal information, uh, which makes it pretty ripe for identity theft. So putting a passphrase on your boot partition means that uh, they're not going to be able to get in there, which is a really good feature. So I'm going to go ahead and click the installation disks here. Uh, I'm going to tell it to install to my primary disk. And it's going to go and it's going to say, I need to select a disk. And I do that. And then I'm going to say that I want to encrypt it also. And I'm going to click done. <clears throat> my passphrase is going to be YouTube. Uh, I don't recommend that passphrase. I recommend something much longer. The longest basically the longest that you can remember. And I'm going to tell it to reclaim space and delete all here so we don't need any of this other stuff here uh, and reclaim space. And from there it's going to figure out uh, how to lay that out and how to delete everything and make everything work and we're going to click the begin installation button. So while this is installing we're going to go ahead and create a user. I want to cover for two seconds uh, Linux and users. So on Windows, you have an administrator account. So every time that box comes up on Windows and says, hey, I'm going to install a program, click yes, blah, blah, blah. Linux kind of has the same thing. There's a root user. The root user is the administrator. And so that means that's the user that can install the programs, can delete any files, etc. And so in general, you always make a user account for yourself. So in my case, I'm going to make a user account for me, Steve. And that user is not going to be an administrator. So my user won't be able to install programs and stuff like that. And it makes it a little more secure because if I download something from the internet, um, it's not going to bring down the whole system. It would only be my user it's confined to. And if I need to install things from the internet, I will download them from places that I know about. And then I'll install those as root so that all users in the system can use it. So it's a Linux security practice, which is really kind of battle tested and is used on almost every server in the world at this point. Uh, but it's a different concept if we're used to coming from Windows that you're like, uh, well, can I just run an administrator? Probably not a great idea. So I'm going to go ahead and click user creation here. And I'm going to say my username is Steve and my password is YouTube. Uh, this password can be totally different and recommended that it's different than your encryption password. So uh, I'm just using that for the example here. And it's tells you that I have a simple password. I click do it anyways for the video's sake, but make your password longer, as long as you can possibly remember, uh, without being too long that you forget it and it's useless. I'm going to go ahead and set a, U pa a root password here too, and that root password is going to be YouTube. And so that way I have my root, which is my administrator account, and I have Steve, which is my user account. So that way everything will be uh, separated by permissions. And so when I'm on Steve account, I'm not breaking the system itself. So this is going to go ahead and install. It's going to take a couple minutes. It's almost entirely dependent on the speed of the USB key and the speed of your drive. This has a Kingston 128-gig uh, SSD in it, so pretty fast drive we're installing to, and it's got a USB 3 key. So the whole install process probably takes about five minutes or so. We're at 70% now, and I'm going to go ahead and fast-forward it while it installs so that we can get to the end. Okay, so Fedora has finished installing, and now there's just a quit button here, and then we can reboot when we're done. Because we're in the live CD mode, it's actually going to take us back to the desktop, so we'll just click the reboot button and then get started on our non-live version, the one that's actually installed in our hard drive. And again, remember, if you did a password, you're going to have to remember all that stuff so that you can enter it in when we boot up. So we've went ahead and we've installed Linux on the hard drive and finished the whole process. And so now it's time for the first reboot. This is going to go ahead and ask me for my encryption passphrase. If you don't see this screen, it's probably because you have a NVIDIA or an ATI card, which is too new to be supported. And you're going to need to look that up on the forums or post a comment on YouTube and I'll send you a link. For our case, we have the Intel card on here, so it's super easy. 
Everything just works out of the box. And I'm going to go ahead and enter my passphrase here. And then you're going to see how fast Linux boots up when not running off USB. And so I've entered my encrypted passphrase. And so uh, basically, there's a slight performance hit with running encryption. So if you weren't running encryption, this would go even faster. But you can see even with full disk encryption, uh, super fast, takes like five seconds to boot up or something. And so there we are. There's my user. Again, not the root user, not the administrator, just my user. And I named him Steve. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to type our YouTube password in. And there we are. We're at our desktop. So super fast. Uh, basically, the whole install took all of five minutes. And now we're at a desktop. It's going to ask me for my language and some other questions here again. And I'm just going to kind of click through that real quick. Um, and then we're, we're good. And so I've actually went ahead and I've plugged this into a wired network so that I can download even faster for video purposes because my uh, Ethernet network is much faster than Wi-Fi even. Uh, however, at home, you may have to click the Wi-Fi button there and log on your network if you want to get network access. So you can see on the box here, though, I have all my network settings are working. And if I go ahead and if I use my function keys, uh, I can turn the brightness down, turn the brightness up, and change the volume keys. Everything works as expected. And... And if you don't want to play games, you can kind of stop there. You have Linux running. You have a web browser already installed. You have an email client that you can use. And there's a whole bunch of different software which you can install. The RPM Fusion repos let us download software that Fedora themselves can't ship. So Fedora ships free software and things that are like copyrighted and they're not able to distribute, those are distributed by other people. RPM Fusion is one of those folks that distributes packages for things that uh, Fedora, for whatever reason, can't ship. So we're going to go ahead and click RPM Fusion here, load the web page, and we're just going to click Enable RPM Fusion on your system. So we click that, and we go ahead and click Fedora 24, open it with our software installer, and click Install. This should go pretty quick here. Uh, we'll need our administrator password to actually do this. And so boom, that's installed. RPM Fusion has two repos, free and non-free. Uh, some of the packages that are non-free are things like NVIDIA drivers and things in which uh, are not free open source software. Some of the things in the free version are uh, things which Fedora can't or doesn't ship but are still free software. So we're going to install both of those for the game's purposes. So now we have RPM Fusion installed. The next thing we're going to do is we're just going to Google for Fedora Steam. And that's going to pop up this site right here, this negative... Negative 017, that's a uh, Fedora maintainer who makes a bunch of great packages available so that we don't have to fuss with anything. We basically download their stuff and install it and we'll have Steam going in no time. So you can see here they've added instructions for how to get the repo installed. So we're just gonna go ahead and do that. I'm gonna pull open a terminal and I'm just gonna use su to go to root, use our password, and I'm gonna go ahead and paste that command in using control shift V. So that's added, and now I can just do a dnf-y install steam, and that will go ahead and install steam on our system. It's uh, with When people have these repos and you can trust them, it's a super handy thing because they've already done all the hard work for us. They've made it into a package. All we have to do is download the package and install it, and things will work just as we expected. So you can see here it's installing and downloading a bunch of files for steam. Uh, so that it will run on Fedora, and we just give it a second to download. I've plugged into the wireless network so that it goes a lot faster, but it still takes some time to download and install those hundreds of megabytes of packages. So I've got my Steam dongle here. I'm going to go ahead and put that in the side of the laptop. Okay, so I've got my batteries on each side. Um, I have to imagine they actually put the, the batteries go on each side of the controller. I have to imagine they did that to make it sure it was balanced, and I really like that idea. That's super cool. I think... This controller just shows how much thought Valve put into things. Uh, it appears that the back is also kind of clicky and definitely a really neat controller. Okay, so my Steam controller is plugged in. I got the batteries in. Uh, this controller feels really nice in the hands. I think they got the perfect weight and construction down. Uh, this is one of the best controllers I've felt. I'm not even a fan of the PlayStation or Xbox controllers and using them, uh, but I'm really excited for this one because it feels like it was just perfect. Like they put a ton of thought into here and it works with Linux, so uh, we're gonna test that out and see how well it does, but uh, already I can tell I'm gonna love this thing. Okay, so now I've started Steam up, and the first thing it does with the dongle plugged in is it actually tells me, hey, you got a controller, do you wanna go into big picture mode? 
So I'm gonna go ahead and click that and then set up the controller. So I've clicked Steam and I've told it to go in big picture mode. And so now it basically goes into full screen mode. If you were gonna hook this up to a TV or a set top box, you'd do exactly the same thing. That's what it's designed for, is that Steam can be used as a computer or as an actual gaming system. Okay, so I plugged my Steam controller in, I booted Steam into big picture mode, and it automatically detected I had the controller installed, and it gave me the option to update the firmware. So you can see that Valve's worked a lot on this experience to make it kind of smooth, seamless, and integrated, and I'm gonna go ahead and let it upgrade the firmware on the controller, and then we're gonna continue with the video. Okay, so I've updated the firmware on my controller, and now it's good to go. So I can actually use the controller already. I didn't have to install any drivers to tweak anything, etc. Literally, the only thing I did is put in that dongle in the USB port. Super cool experience. Now it's big picture mode, and I can actually go and select Prison Architect and launch it from this interface. So I have all my games here and everything. It's it's super cool. I mean, I'm just it's a slick experience and the controller is working perfectly. I'm just using the joystick button here to go through my stuff. And uh, I'm gonna pick my installed game here, Prison Architect, and it says, this game wasn't designed for controllers. It says, but it will let me play with it. And that's fine. And so as you can see there, when I'm actually going to use a game that isn't meant for a controller, Steam allows the community to provide controller profiles. So I'm able to actually select a controller profile somebody else in the community made that says it has same defaults for the game. So super cool that kind of everybody can collaborate and make different profiles and different preferences. Uh, and the controller will use all these things. So I'm really digging the system here. So now you can actually see I'm playing Prison Architect. And this, this joypad right here is giving me uh, haptic feedback. And it's working as a mouse. So this is working as like a super precise mouse pointer. And I'm really liking the way that feels. That's cool. And uh, let's see here. So if I can use the joystick also if I want to. And I can move around. And that actually, so the joystick moves my viewport. So I can move up. And then this is actually my mouse cursor. And so if I click on here, let's see. What do we need to do first? Uh, we can go and we can do this. And I'll do A. What's the key here? Uh, so to click. Ah, okay. So to click, we just use the back trigger buttons, and that works just like clicking. Let's go ahead and build a building, just so I can show an example here. So I'm going to go ahead and say foundations. And I can scoot that up. That's great. I'm really, I'm getting used to this awful fast, uh, which is really cool. Yeah, so there's a building. There we go. So it's going to build, and when I unpause this, my construction workers will get to work and they'll start building it. Uh, I am super impressed with the controller, the intuitiveness, the profiles that you can download, and I think this is a real winner. And it's all running on open source software. So Steam itself is closed source, but Fedora enables this to happen. And the Fedora, as you saw, it only took about 10 minutes to install, to configure, to get Steam on there, to go. And uh, my XPS 13 has brought a whole new level of fun to the equation now. So until next time.